Okay, let's have a look at this one. So what we went over on Friday was the relationship between normal force and the force of friction. We said the force of friction is mu times the normal force. All right, mu being the coefficient of friction, okay, normal force being the reactive force between something and its and a surface. Okay, so for an inclined plane, okay, the forces that are involved, obviously gravity is pulling straight down, which creates a normal force straight out from the surface. Okay, and then the sum of those two is F parallel. Okay, we've talked about that before. But we need normal force now in order to get the force of friction. Okay, so we're told it's a 20 kilogram box, which means that this side is 196.2 newtons. And then we can calculate the other two forces. So we'll calculate F parallel, because obviously F parallel is pretty important, because it's the force pulling it down the ramp. Friction would then be opposing up the ramp. Okay, so we would need to calculate normal force in order to get the force of friction. Okay, and we got to calculate F parallel so we know the downward force. All right, so let's calculate F parallel first because that's something we're familiar with. So sine of 40 times 196.2 will give me my F parallel. All right, so I got 126.115 newtons, okay, down the ramp. And now I'm going to get my normal force. It's the adjacent side. So I'm going to go cos of 40 degrees times 196.2. So 150.298. And now I can use this number to get my force of friction. So force of friction will be 0.185, because that's what they told us the coefficient of friction was, times 150.298. All right, so we're looking at a force of friction of 27.805 newtons. All right, can I calculate my net force acting on the box now? All right, so I'm going to subtract friction from F parallel. So I'll have my uh, 126.114929 minus our answer from the last one. So we're looking at 98.310 or 310. Okay, uh, newtons, oops, sorry, that's not supposed to go with that, okay, uh, is my net force, and then I'm going to divide that by my mass, 20 kilograms, so the acceleration is going to be 4.9 um, meters per second squared down the ramp. Okay, so it doesn't change inclined plane questions a whole lot, but you do have to calculate normal force if you're given the coefficient of friction or if you're asked to calculate it, okay, then you'll have to calculate normal force. Okay, is that ringing a bell from last week? Okay. So tomorrow we're going to be doing a lab to do with normal force and friction. Okay, it's super easy. Um, you're just going to be pulling some little weighted sleds along the floor with a force meter. Okay, so the force meter will be connected to your phone, right? And you're just going to give them a pull and measure how much force is required to get them moving. Okay, and then we'll graph that and we'll investigate the relationship between normal force and force of friction. And as a result of that, we'll calculate mu. Okay, and that'll be the coefficient of friction between the floor and the sleds. Okay, that we'll be using. They're small sleds. Don't picture like a toboggan. Okay, like a little sled this big. Okay. Everybody with me there? All right. So that's what we'll do tomorrow after your quiz. Okay. Because you'll have a quiz tomorrow. And it'll probably have some friction related stuff on it. But today, we're going to talk about Newton's third law. All right. It's not one that we've gone over yet. So, it'll just, but it is in your notes. Okay. I'm just going to bring it up here. All right. So, Newton's third law, we've already talked about a whole bunch of times, but I've never really gone over it formally. So that's what I'm going to do today. Okay, Newton's third law is the physical law that is most often misapplied to other situations. Okay, Newton's third law says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. 
from a physics perspective. What that means is if I push on the wall, the wall has to push back, all right? If the wall doesn't push back, then I keep going forward, which would look really cool. I would look awesome as I crush through the wall, okay? I'd be like the Kool-Aid man. Now, um, it obviously doesn't work that way. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The problem with that is that it's, people are always trying to apply it to other things. Like uh, if you say something horrible to someone and they smack you in the face, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. It's like, how does that apply there? That's the one I hear most often, it's stupid. Okay, you said something awful and they smacked you, you had it coming, okay? That wasn't an opposite or, you know, opposite reaction, it was like an appropriate reaction, I don't know, okay? but it's weird. People try and misapply it all the time. Okay, what we need to understand for physics is that all forces act in pairs. Okay, every action is equal and opposite reaction, so every action has a, has a reaction, so there's always a pair. Okay, understand what's meant by normal force. Okay, we've talked about normal force a whole bunch. We know normal force is that reactive force, okay, that happens when one surface is pushed into another. And obviously, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now, has anyone in here ever fired a gun? What do you have to be mindful of when you fire a gun? Besides what end that you're looking at or which way it's pointing, okay? Other than that, what? The recoil, okay? It's comical when people don't remember about or don't think about the recoil, okay? What causes the recoil? The explosion, yeah, okay? But the explosion is supposed to just push the bullet out. Okay, so you detonate the, the gunpowder and the gases expand. Now, obviously, the barrel is sealed. Well, they're almost sealed. Okay, um, and so the gases expand and they push on the bullet. When they push on the bullet, the bullet pushes back. That's the recoil you feel. Okay, the exploding gases, expanding gases, push the, push the bullet out and the gun kicks back into your shoulder, okay? If it's a rifle, if it's a handgun, obviously you have to brace yourself a little bit differently on that, okay? If you do not brace yourself, you can be injured, right? Not by the bullet, but by the gun itself, okay? In fact, you'll often see people who fire a whole bunch and haven't been firing a lot, they'll get a big bruise on their shoulder, okay? From the butt of the rifle, because they always hold it away. And then when the gun fires, it kicks back and hits them in the shoulder, okay? Um, so you have to be mindful of that. You always want to be resting on your shoulder. You're gonna be way more accurate that way anyway, okay? When you're firing a handgun, okay? If, because I've seen people do this, they just like hold a hand, they think they're, you know, like in the movies, they even got like, on the side like this and it just and the thing comes in and gets them right in the side of the head okay because you can't hand like just one hand unless you're really experienced and actually fairly strong you are not going to hold the gun straight when you fire it okay you need to brace with two hands and you'll often see people who lean into it that's in order to brace themselves okay for that for that recoil okay uh, i'll show you a little video here because it's funny obviously in that one there okay there's a reaction there at the end Okay, where he gets it in the face, right? And that's because he's holding it out here like this with, and there's no butt on the, on the rifle or on the shotgun, okay? So as soon as he fires it, the expanding gas is bringing it straight back to his face, okay? And so it's just a matter of not accounting for that reactive force that's gonna be present, okay? So in Newton's third law, okay? And this is how rocket engines work as well, okay? Rocket engines work by having pressurized gases that are expanding inside of them. And then when they're, uh, because they're pressurized, they want to escape. So the tank is pushing on them and they push back on the tank and that's what pushes you up, right? It's the same with a balloon. If you're blown up a balloon and let it go, okay? The pressure there is from the gases inside. They push on the balloon, the balloon pushes back, okay? And when uh, you let them go, okay, it can provide thrust that you know sends the balloon in a random path around the room, okay? Everybody with me on that? All right, so you do have to be mindful of that though in contact sports. Okay, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. That's why sometimes even when a guy lays somebody else out in a big like open ice hit, they get hurt just as bad, all right? Because they can separate their shoulder, things like that. Okay? If you're not red or you hit the person, okay, and you didn't get low enough or brace yourself, okay, that, remember, you hit them, but they're gonna hit you back, all right? Uh, same if you put somebody into the boards, okay? 
they hit the boards, the boards hit back, that can be translated through to you, okay? Um, so you gotta be mindful of those things when you are engaging in contact sports, okay? Football is probably one of the worst ones, okay? If you're, you know, on the line, you know, they, they come together there when the ball is snapped, okay? You got helmets on helmets and it's all nasty, okay? Well, there's, again, action, reaction pairs going on there like crazy, okay? All right, so in this situation here, Okay. This person is on this canoe. They're going to run along the canoe and jump onto the dock. Possible? Yes. Possible. Well, I, I don't have a video of it, but the, it used to be a video, but for some reason it doesn't roll now. But he could you can make it onto the dock. Okay. You can totally make it onto the dock. If you do it wrong, your teeth will get on the dock and you won't. Okay. That would be bad. So, what's the key though to making this work? Hmm? Nope, canoe doesn't have to be moving forward. He's going to run. The canoe is stationary. He doesn't have a paddle. That's why he has to do this. See? No paddles. All right. So, he's trying to get onto the dock. So, he's going to run along the dock and jump off and onto the dock. Okay. It's about the direction you apply your force. Okay? If you want to jump effectively, should you push downwards and backwards or mostly backwards? Downwards and backwards. Okay? You want to push downwards and backwards okay, so that you can jump off. In the end, even if you just pushed backwards, you would still have a force acting on you in return. Okay? You could probably still get there, but the boat will travel backwards more. Okay? than if you push downwards and backwards. Because if you push downwards and backwards, it's not just the boat, it's all the water under it, okay? It's acting, okay? Essentially what Newton's third law says is that the mass, uh, mass one and acceleration one are equal to mass two and acceleration two, okay? That's what he's saying. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction except this one would be negative. Okay. Now, um, if mass one is really, really large and mass two is really, really small, the accelerations are going to be a lot different. Okay, that's what Newton's second or third law says that those those accelerations will be very different. That's what you'd have to be concerned about here. You run along this canoe. Okay, the whole time you're running, you're pushing back on the canoe. It's accelerating backwards and you're accelerating forwards. Okay, but if it's been accelerating backwards the whole time you were running along it. Okay, by the time you get to the end, maybe it's accelerated away from the dock too much, okay, and you can't cross the distance anymore, all right? So you want to make sure you're pushing down, down, and then at the very end, down and backwards so that it exerts a force on you that is upwards in the opposite direction, okay, including the water underneath it, and then you would make it to the dock, okay? Whereas if you just push straight backwards, you know, it'll fly out from underneath you, okay, and might start a rotating force on you that would be bad. Okay. Everybody kind of follow on how that one would work? Okay. All right, um, so looking at this then, this is the whole um, like car collision thing again. If I have a semi-truck colliding with a smart car, the forces are equal. Okay. The force experienced by the truck is the same same size as the force experienced by the smart car. What's different? Their mass and as a result their their accelerations. Okay? The acceleration of the truck will be small compared to the acceleration of the smart car. Its smaller mass means it will experience a much greater acceleration. Okay? Um, this is something that as an if you were an astronaut you would have to be mindful of. Okay. If you were moving away from your ship, for example, by pushing on it, okay, you push on it and you move away from it, and the ship would also move away. Okay, but which one's going to be greater? You. You have much less mass than your ship. Okay, but you would accelerate the ship slightly, and that would have to be something that your maybe a mission control would have to look at. Okay, if you were traveling a great distance, even that small, tiny amount could result in you know that triangle getting bigger at the end, okay, and you missing your target by a long way. 
right? So they're all things that need to be taken into account. Uh, and it's something we saw a little bit of in that uh, Mission to Mars uh, video that we watched there the other day, okay, things like that. All right, uh, you see it in the Martian as well, okay? They do a pretty good job of this um, when, they, when they're rescuing Mark Watney, okay? Like, so he's, he, he said he's gonna go Iron Man and cut a hole in his suit, okay? So he's using, again, pressurized gas within his suit to create thrust, right? It's pushing on the inside of, its, of his suit. The suit pushes back. And as soon as he ruptures the glove, okay, he's got a source of thrust okay, that he can direct. When they initially catch him, how many people have you seen, have you seen that movie? Okay. When they catch him he, and they spin around each other there okay, with, uh, with the, what is the rope or whatever it is, like a strap or something, okay, and you can see them just continuing to orbit around each other until they run out of rope and then they smash into one another. Okay. That's all, again, Newton's third law. Okay. She exerts a force on him. He exerts a force back. They actually orbit a common center. Okay. They don't orbit her. He doesn't orbit her. They both spin because right? they're both exerting a force on each other. All right. So with the uh, spacecraft here, okay, this is what we were talking about a minute ago, okay, so the person, the spacecraft has a mass of 11,000 kilograms, okay, the astronaut has a mass of 92 kilograms. When they push off, they exert 36 newtons worth of force on the spacecraft. Find the acceleration of the spacecraft and the astronaut. So again, what we need to remember is that the force on the astronaut is equal but opposite to the force on the spacecraft. That's what Newton's third law says. All right, so that means then that the mass of the astronaut times the acceleration of the astronaut equals negative mass of the spacecraft times acceleration of the spacecraft. Everybody all right with that? Okay, so I know that the force on the astronaut is 36 newtons, and so is the force on the spacecraft, all right? But the astronaut exerted a force of positive 36 newtons on the spacecraft, so the force that the astronaut experiences is negative 36, all right? So now I can calculate the accelerations of both of them using Newton's second law. All I need Newton's third law for is to get the the forces to be equal, right? Once I realize that, then it just becomes a Newton's second law question. We got Newton's second law equals Newton's second law here. Okay, so uh, I've got 36 Newtons is the force, negative 36 Newtons on the astronaut equals the mass of the astronaut times the acceleration of the astronaut. So I divide both sides by the mass of the astronaut, which we were told was 92 kilograms, okay? And I'll get their acceleration. So 36 divided by 92, the acceleration of the astronaut is 0.39 meters per second squared backwards, right? Whereas for the um, spacecraft, it's going to be 36 divided by 11,000. Is that a pretty small acceleration? That's 3.3 millimeters per second squared, right? It's not much. But if you were on a space voyage that was going to be over a year and a half, could that small amount of acceleration, if not corrected for, add up? Right? I mean, you're not, it's only going to accelerate for that instant while they're in contact with each other. Okay? After that, it's going to travel at a constant velocity. But have you altered its trajectory even the slightest amount? Okay? And when we're talking about large travel distances, that can add up. All right? So all of that has to be taken into account. That's why they're continually doing course adjustments on spacecraft, right? Like um, the New Horizons probe that went to Pluto. You guys remember that from a couple of years ago? Okay, on New Year's Day, it's going to have its first encounter with another Kuiper Belt object, okay? It will be the furthest um, object ever visited by an Earth-born spacecraft, right? They have made trajectory changes to New Horizons basically once or twice a month over the last few months, okay? Constantly double checking and making sure, you know, any gravitational anomalies haven't moved it here or there, okay? So that it will be on course to uh, meet up with that object. When it was going to Pluto, they were constantly making adjustments because as it got closer, they discovered more and more uh, things were orbiting Pluto and they didn't want it to run into any of them. Okay, so they constantly had to make adjustments to it. A little small, small adjustments. We're not talking a huge amount of thrust. New Horizons thrusters are not very powerful. 
Okay, they're just for making small adjustments. So that small, like five second burst of gas, okay, is good enough to make a course adjustment over the next, you know, month and a half or whatever. Okay, everybody with me on how that one worked? All right. All right. So that's what we just talked about. That's the math we just did. All right. So um, this is one that people always ask about. If I'm walking, I'm pushing backwards on the earth and the earth is pushing forwards on me and that's how i walk okay so shouldn't every time we walk we should slow the earth down a little bit like if we got everybody in one place okay and it, actually nike had a commercial about this about a year ago it was their super bowl ad i think okay and they had everybody running and they were kevin hart was in it and they were trying to reverse this they were reversing the spin of the earth by all running which is like the dumb, I just like, I'm turning it off. I'm not watching this anymore because it's stupid. Okay. You can't do, you can't reverse the spin of the earth by having everybody walk in the same direction at the same time. All right. For one thing, um, the earth's surface is, I mean, we consider it to be solid, but I mean, when you're walking, is there always a little bit of slippage? Right. And plus there's all the molten like mantle and stuff like that, that doesn't really transfer the forces through. It's not like earth is a perfect sphere. Okay. Um, but also because the earth's mass is enormous okay this is the earth's mass 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms that's 598 with 22 zeros behind it all right our mass even if we took the mass of every person on earth if every person on earth weighed let's say you know 50 kilograms okay we're still not talking about any where near that, even if we said 100 kilograms, okay, and most people don't weigh 100 kilograms, okay, but if we said they all weighed 100 kilograms, including small children, right, we still don't even make a dent in that mass. Plus, we're technically part of that mass, but that's argument for a different day, okay? The whole idea that you could change the rotation of the Earth due to Newton's third law is just ridiculous, okay? You can't make any difference whatsoever in the movement or acceleration of the Earth, okay? There's other ideas that if everybody jumped in the same place at the same time, Okay, that you could knock the Earth off out of its orbit. And if that, that was the case, we were in real trouble. All right, so it doesn't work. All right, application of Newton's third law. How many of you have ever seen the crazy people towing the like U-Haul little U-Haul trailers down the Deerfoot at 120? You know those ones that have the big sign on the fender well that says maximum speed 80 kilometers per hour. Those ones, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the issue with those U-Haul trailers is that a lot of the cars towing them don't have an electronic brake connection. That means that they cannot operate the trailer brakes by pressing the brakes in the car. Okay? And that can lead to a condition known as jackknifing. Right? That's when if something towing something else stops suddenly, the trailer obeys Newton's first law, which is... It continues moving at a constant velocity. So it'll rotate around the car and try to pass it. Okay, on a semi truck, right, that means it's sliding down the highway sideways, right, while the truck is trying to stop. So anytime you're pulling in front of someone who's towing a trailer or a big semi truck, keep in mind that they're big and heavy. Okay, if they slam on the brakes, they're not going to stop quickly and they could jackknife, which means they'll get sideways and cover the entire highway. Okay, I've actually seen that happen in the wintertime. Okay, um, there was a huge traffic jam. I pulled off into the ditch, okay? And the semi-truck, had I not pulled off into the ditch, the semi-truck would have killed me because it took the top off of a car that was in the middle, okay? This car had spun out and was in the middle of the highway. The truck driver tried to, he hit the brakes, but there just was like basically zero friction. So the trailer turned, got sideways, and went right along the road and cut the top off that car. Luckily, there was nobody in the car they had gotten out, okay? but it literally cut the top off. Okay, um, So it's you know, we got to watch out for jackknifing. That can happen a lot with these little trailers because you can't operate the brakes on these trailers okay? if there's no electronic um, mechanism for doing so. So what U-Haul did is they installed a reaction force brake application. So when you apply the brakes, the trailer keeps moving forwards, okay? It pushes on you and your car pushes back. So what they've done is inside the hitch, they have a spring-loaded actuator so that when the trailer comes forward and pushes on you and you push back, you compress the spring that applies non-electric brakes on the trailer. 
because they have way too many of these that were causing jackknife accidents. Because right? people usually are towing those have never towed a trailer before and have no idea what they're doing. Okay? So they applied, they put these um, reaction force application mechanisms on their trailers so that cars, even that didn't have electric brake hookups, could still at least apply some braking on those trailers. If you're going really fast though, they won't work because you'll you'll slam on the brakes and the trailer will just rotate immediately, okay, instead of having enough time to apply that force. That's why the maximum speed on those trailers is 80 kilometers an hour. Keep that in mind if you're ever towing one. Don't go faster than that, okay? The brakes won't work, yeah? Okay. But it's a good application of it. It was a smart idea. Okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna go over a couple of examples here, okay? Uh, this one first, okay? We've done a few like this according to Newton's second law, okay? These kind of box systems, there's multiple boxes. So keep in mind what we did with those. These work pretty much the same. So I've got these three boxes, A, B, and C, right? They're in contact with each other. They're on a frictionless surface, okay? We apply a force to box A and all the boxes, so the whole system, accelerates at one and a half meters per second squared to the right. You want to calculate how much force box C exerts on box B. Okay, because we've gone over this when we talked about systems, I know you guys know how to do this. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes and see if you figure it out. Okay, we know the acceleration, we know the mass, right? Let's see how you do. Okay, so our first decision when we're facing a question like this is, what box do I use to calculate this? Okay, the most obvious choice would be to use box C. Okay, we want to use box C because A, that's the one it, it asked about, but B, because box C has the least amount of forces acting on it, right? What I usually do is I kind of, in my head, look at some free body diagrams of the boxes, right? Box A, has a force forwards that we're um, not told what it is, right? So there's the applied force of the hand, and then there's the force of B on A. And I don't know what that is either. So I don't know either one of those forces. I can't really use box A to figure anything else, to figure anything out about box C, right? For box B, right, um, there's the force of A on B, right? The force of box A is pushing it forwards, and then there's the force of C on B, and that's the force they actually want us to find, right? But I can't figure it out because I don't know what the other forces acting on box B are either. But what I do know is that for box C, because this is a frictionless surface, there is only one force acting on it, and that's the force exerted on it by box B. And according to Newton's third law, the force exerted on C by B is equal to the force C exerts back on B. Okay, everybody follow me there. So that's the intuitive part of this question. The math of this question is actually quite simple, right? This is the only force acting on box C, which is five kilograms. Therefore, it is the only force. It's the net force. Okay, I only have to do a net force calculation, that's it. I multiply the mass of the box by its acceleration and I have the force of box B acting on box C. Now, that's not what the question wanted. The question wanted the force of C on B. So what do I do with that number? I make a negative and I'm done. All right, so every Newton's second law question is really a Newton's, sorry, every Newton's third law question is really just a Newton's second law question. All right, all the math is still Newton's second law. And we've done a bunch of these. It's just a system. The only thing I have to remember is that within that system, there are action-reaction pairs. All right, when B pushes on C, C pushes back. Okay. All right, questions there? We're going to work on a few of these. Don't panic if you didn't get that first one. All right, so... Now, we'll go back to the previous example, okay? Now I want to find the force that B exerts on A, all right? So um, remember that we know the acceleration, 
Okay? And we know the force that C exerts on B. We calculated that to be negative 7.5 newtons. All right? That's the information we have and all the information that we need. So we're trying to find the force that B exerts on A. Which box should you use here? B. Yeah. So as we said, we want to use box B in order to figure this out, okay? Because we're looking for the force box B exerts on box A. Even though that's a force acting on box A, we still have a reactive force on B that we can use for that. So the reason that there's a force on A from B is because there's a force of A on B. All right, and that's the forward propelling force acting on box B, which has a mass of 10 kilograms. All right, now the force, what other force is acting on box B? Yeah, box C, that force we already found. And we know its value, it's 7.5 newtons this direction. All right, we also know that the acceleration of B is 1.5 meters per second squared because they told us that in the previous question. All right, so can I find the net force on B? Yep, all right, so the, the net force in this situation is going to be 15 newtons, 10 times 1.5. All right, so the net force is 15 newtons, and that is the sum of, okay, the force of C on B plus the force of A on B. And I'm looking for this force. So I'm going to subtract the force of C on B. So what I'll have is 15 newtons, which is forwards, minus negative 7.5 newtons, because it's backwards, equals the force of A on B. All right, we only have two significant figures here, so it'll end up being 23 newtons. Okay. Um, on box B, that's forward, but on box A, it's backwards. All right. So again, just system questions, just like we did before, okay? Nothing has changed in that regard. We just have to, there's, again, there's more intuitive stuff, okay? But it still broke down to vector sum of all forces and M times A. I don't know how many times I've said that, but it's a lot now, okay? But they all come down to that. Okay, try this one. It's only two boxes, but, okay, now there's friction. It actually makes it easier. You have one more force. Okay, it gives you more information when you have friction. So, all right, give that one a try. All right, so I'm trying to find the force of box B on box A, right? I'm gonna use box B to figure that out, right? Because I have more information about box B than I have about box A. I don't know what the force of friction is on box A. So I'm not gonna be able to figure it out using box A. So I'm gonna isolate box B, right? Which is 8.5 kilograms. I know there's a force forwards on box B from A. Okay, that's the force of A acting on B. And that force will be equal to, but opposite, the force of B on A. And that's what we want. Okay, So if I can find this force, I'll know this force. The other forces involved are friction. And it's 28.3 newtons. All right, so I know the force of friction. I also know the acceleration, which means I can find the net force acting on box B. So I'll go 8.5 times 2.6, and I'll have my net force. Oh, come on, turn on. So 8.5 times 2.6. So the net force acting on box B is 22.1 kilograms. All right, so... Sorry, I said kilograms, it's supposed to be newtons, 22.1 newtons. All right, that means okay, that the net force can also be calculated by the sum of all forces. So we'll have the force of A on B plus the force of friction. So I'm going to solve for this one by going F net minus the force of friction equals the force of A on B, which from B's perspective is a forward directed force. So we'll have 22.1 forward minus negative 28.3 okay, equals the force of A on B. All 
All right, so we're looking at 50.4 newtons forwards. But for box A, it's 50.4 newtons backwards. Okay, every action is equal and opposite reaction. So if this is the force, okay, 50.4. It's actually just 50 because we only have two significant figures. Okay, I wrote kilograms again. 50 newtons, okay, so it's 50 newtons forward on B, so it's 50 newtons backwards on A. Okay. These really aren't, I, right now you guys are, I think, treating them differently than the system questions we did before. Okay, They're still exactly the same as the system questions we did before. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that one? Okay, I want you to try this question here with the horse team that's dragging the two logs out from the harvesting area. Okay. Because we've done a few questions with like one box attached to another box by a cable. Right? We did just fine with those, but as soon as I said it's a Newton's third law question, suddenly we're having trouble with them. This is just like the ones we did before. Okay. Two boxes attached by a rope. Okay. In this case it's two logs attached by a chain, but it's still two boxes attached by a rope. We need to find what they are asking for there. All right, I'll give you a minute or two and then we'll draw the diagram and then I'll give you a little bit more time. Okay, so we have the two logs. Okay, the first log is the smaller of the two. Okay, so uh, the first log is 150 kilograms and the second log is 250 kilograms. Right? We know that the force of the horses is pulling the entire system forwards with 2,600 newtons. Okay. The ground exerts friction of a total magnitude of 2,400 newtons on the logs, plural. Okay. So in other words, it's saying simplify so that you have a system, at least for the first part, 2,600 newtons okay, and then uh, 2,400 newtons on 400 kilograms worth of mass, okay? Um, for part B, they tell us a little bit more information. They tell us the force of friction on log A is 900 newtons, okay? Which means we could figure out the force of friction on the 250 kilogram one if we wanted to, because we know the total amount of friction, okay? But at least for part A, you only need that top simplified system diagram, okay? For part B, you'll have to isolate. All right, I'll give you a couple more minutes there, see if you can figure out the acceleration of the system for part A. Okay, so if we're going to find the acceleration of the system, okay, and we're going to need that, because we're going to have to isolate different parts of the system, so we'll need to know their accelerations a little bit later. So to find the acceleration of the system is just calculate the net force. So 2600 minus 2400 is that we have a net force of 200 newtons. Okay, that net force is acting on 400 kilograms worth of mass, meaning we have an acceleration of 0.5 meters per second squared forward. Okay. Now that we have that, now we can isolate the different logs, right? So for part B, they wanna know the force exerted by log B on log A. All right, the easiest way for me to solve this is actually using log A. All right, so I'm going to look at log A. It's being pulled forwards by 2,600 newtons. We know friction is resisting with 900 newtons. What's the other force acting on log A? Log B. Okay, and that's the one they want us to find. Well, I already know the acceleration of the system, so can I calculate the net force acting on just log A? All right, so I'm gonna find the net force on log A okay, by um, doing mass times acceleration. So 150 times 0.5 tells me the net force on log A is 75 newtons forwards. Now that I know that, I can go to sum of all forces. So F net equals okay, the force applied by the horses plus the force of friction plus the force of B on A. 
So I'm looking for the force of B on A. I'm going to subtract the other two over. Okay, so I'll have F net minus force a, or force applied minus the force of friction equals the force of B on A. So that'll be 75 minus um, 2600. Okay, those are both positive. Minus negative 900. Okay, because friction was backwards. So if I go 75. Whoop, 75 minus 2600 minus negative 900 right, gives me 1625. So what do we have here for significant figures? Three. Yeah, so we'd have 1.63 times 10 to the 2, um, 10 to the 3, sorry, Newtons. Yeah, backwards. Okay. All right. Did we do ones like that before? Okay, they're really just a Newton's second law question. All Newton's third law questions are really just Newton's second law questions, where at the end or at the beginning, whichever order it's going in, we have to remember that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? Other than that, they're no different than any Newton's second law question that we've done. Okay. Try this one. It's super easy. It's not a system question. Okay, it's just way easier than that. Right? It's two people standing on the ice and they're gonna push off of each other. Okay, assuming the ice is frictionless, they're just gonna push off of each other. I want you to calculate okay, the acceleration of the second person. Okay, well, all we have to remember is that the force on student A is equal but opposite to the force on student B. All right? Can I calculate the force on student A? Right, I have their mass, I have their acceleration, so I can do that. Okay, all I have to do is take the uh, 38 kilograms and multiply that by 0.6 meters per second squared. All right, so that's the force on student A. It's also the force on student B, except on student B it's negative. So I just take that and I divide by the um, acceleration of uh, student B, and I will have her mass. All right, so her mass is 30 kilograms. All right, again, not terribly difficult. All we have to remember is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. All right, uh, there's a couple more problems just like that one in your digital workbook. I want to finish off with those. Okay, tomorrow's quiz will likely have friction-based questions on it because okay, we talked about that on Friday, and they because they have some normal force in them have you know Newton's third law components. There will not be any box B, box A, box C questions like you did today on tomorrow's quiz. It'll just be friction and Newton's second law. That question. Um, I don't know. I just did. It's the same as 30. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll call that up here. Okay, so there's only four questions there, guys, and you already did number one. So there's really only three. Okay, so I want you working on, okay, questions two, three, and four here. 